Okay, so let's get going. Um, so I'm actually going to cover the the slides are really just to make sure that we cover the uh, overview and uh, I do our architecture and some of these others information that you really can't show through the demo. Um, and then I'm going to jump into the demo and I'll start with the sensor. And even though we don't get I don't get to talk about Sentinel until Friday, I do want to give you a little bit of a uh, um, <laughs> kind of a head start because a Defender for IoT has really fantastic integration with uh, Sentinel, so I want to highlight that today. Um, if time allows, hopefully it does. If not, then we'll cover it Friday during the Sentinel session. And <clears throat> now you're going to move these here. So why are we even talking about IoT and OT? Um, because uh, these devices have really long been ignored, and the level of uh, a risk associated with it is quite high. Actually, some of the attacks on OT networks can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour. Um, and some of the risks are financial in nature, but some are actually a lot more serious. Actually, in, in 2021, <clears throat> if you don't know, I am in Florida. And in 2021, a hacker got access to a water treatment plant here in Florida in a city of about 15,000 people, and they tried to poison the water supply with the wrong combination of uh, chemicals. That was uh, in Oldsmar, Florida. And we've also heard of attacks on power grids like Triton or Trisis, uh, where malware was actually delivered. Uh, it was designed to disable the safety system so that overheating things, etc., which obviously can also cause loss of life. So sometimes we're talking money, but in some of these cases, we're talking uh, human loss. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm also sure you probably heard about the Colonial Pipeline attack, which was in the news due to um, not not that long ago. Um, and there was even another incident where NASA was hacked because uh, somebody plugged in an unauthorized Raspberry Pi and connected it to their network. So we, these are the types of stories that keep happening, unfortunately. Um, and also a few things to keep in mind, especially for you as partners as you go out to the world to to try to talk about to customers about this service. <clears throat> the number of unmanaged IoT and OT devices continues to increase. In 2021, we estimated around 12 billion devices. That's expected to be 27 billion by 2025. So it's quite a lot of devices that you're going to see. And if we don't have visibility, then we can protect them. And we also see IoT devices in OT networks, like temperature controls, et cetera. So the lines are really getting blurred. And, and you'll see how we, how we um, protect these devices from different areas. Okay, so that's why we're talking about Defender for IoT. And let me go through some very important facts about Defender for IoT. First of all, it's agentless. So it's great for those machines that you can't install an antivirus on. We, what we do is we mirror or and we monitor the traffic from the switch and we do it without installing any agents and without interfering with the network. Um, Defender from IoT, uh, it, as you may or may not know, it comes from our CyberX acquisition and it's actually going to be very obvious because the user that I use to log into the sensor is CyberX. Um, and it was built specifically for industrial IoT and OT networks. Uh, and as you'll see in the demo, you can discover all sorts of devices on the network, uh, what the CVEs that are uh, that can be exploited on them. But we also are constantly monitoring the network. So if there's suspicious activity or anything outside of the norm in the network, you will we'll also get an alert on that. And then on top of that, we have threat intelligence that is specific for um, IoT and OT. <clears throat> Hold on. We have, you might have heard, or you may hear in the future about a group inside Microsoft called Section 52. It's kind of the equivalent of Mystic, but it's specifically for threat intelligence that is for IoT and OT. Um, but the most important thing I think about the vendor for IoT is that it's passive. We get this question a lot, actually. Uh, it is not active in the network. And that is very important because some of these networks, um, the the noise can cause some serious disruptions on some OT devices. Right, then. 
There we go. That's moving. I actually want to move through these. Um, so this is how we are approaching um, this type of uh, of uh, visibility. So traditionally, a SOG team doesn't have OT knowledge, um, not not the knowledge anyway that is required to be able to detect and remediate an attack on an OT system. They're also usually SOC teams are more IT oriented. Uh, and usually any changes that need to be done on those systems, those OT systems, you need someone on site to be able to make the changes. Also, stock engineers, they may not know what are the effects of some type of remediation that they want to do. What kind of effect is it going to have on a production system as well? Actually, I actually heard this story from another security engineer, but I thought it's a great example of the risk associated. They were working on uh, windmills. And someone decided that they were going to run a scan on the network to find out if there were any vulnerabilities. But the noise ended up bringing down machines. And one of those machines was inside a uh, windmill where the nearest ignition was like 100 miles in, uh, away from it. And that person had to drive, and it was winter time, and they had to climb the tower to be able to reset that machine inside the windmill. So, so when I mentioned that they're very susceptible to noise, it's that type of example that, that I'm thinking of. Um, and that's just one of the challenges. Also, not having a single pane of glass for both IT and OT, it's really blocking analysts from being able to see when an attacker is moving laterally between OT and IT systems. So you, need, you really need the ability or to have that visibility to maybe isolate affected systems as well. So that's how we're looking at it. Um, we address these challenges with both Sentinel and Defender for IoT. Um, both, in fact, actually both teams are working towards the same goal. They're actually they're actually under the same uh, reporting organization. That makes it really easy um, to have the same type of goals. Um, but the goal is converging IT and OT into a unified SOC. And with that single pane of glass for the entire organization, uh, because that's a lot more efficient than really uh, and really the only way to reduce the time to mitigate threats um, as fast as possible. Um, this is really the only way that you can see whether an attacker uh, maybe starts on a endpoint, moves to the cloud, and then moves to um, some uh, workstation and some manufacturing facility. Um, and then from there jumps onto a PLC. That's, this is what you need to be able to see that. Also, it's a really very simple integration, uh, which is I'll, I'll show you today. Um, and once that's integrated, that's it. There's nothing else to do afterwards. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's like you know you don't have to worry about upgrading one and then having to configure the other one again. No, not the case here. Um, oops, so this might have moved a little fast. Here we go. So what do you get when you get um, when you're using IoT uh, Sentinel? We're really converging IT and OT. So you can have the visibility from that single pane of glass. And we're going to, first of all, we're going to stream the alerts from Defender for IoT. I'm going to show you um, how those alerts are going to show up through both Defender for IoT. So you don't really need Sentinel, but I'm, I'm still going to highlight that because I'm going to tie it all up together later in the week, and I want to show you that integration. Um, and also, you get additional insights on those assets. Um, you're going to get the any CVEs, any risk cores. Also, you, you'll see um, in the UEBA uh, in Sentinel, there's an entity space, and you're actually going to see the IoT devices there as well. And there's also, again, like I said, the ability to see when uh, an attack starts on one uh, an IT side and ends up on the OT side and vice versa. Uh, plus, you get additional OT context data. Um, and that you actually get information about like where the sensor is located and um, and and you can even have an owner for the device and things like that. Um, and you also get a link to Defender for IoT um, um, back and forth. It's very similar to the Defender 365 type of integration. Um, so you can get additional information and you also um, and I actually will share a content hub solution that includes a workbook, some analytic tools, and some playbooks um, to get that going to be able to get you going immediately. Um, so this is really 
just a slide on uh, section 52 that I mentioned. This is the security research group for Defender for IoT. Um, or the for me, it's like the mystic, but for IoT and OT. Uh, they do threat hunting. They do malware uh, reverse engineering. They do incident response. Um, they do uh, all, all of this stuff for devices like PLCs, for HMIs, that I think stands for Human Machine Interface. Um, it's all really focused on IT and OIT and, oh, and OT as well. Okay, let's see. Oops. There we go. Um, and again, <clears throat> a little more on Section 52. Um, I'm just showing you some of what they have been contributing to the industry, which is really quite significant. Uh, I was actually watching a presentation from this team where they show how they discovered a vulnerability on a home alarm system where they were able to remotely disarm it in a matter of seconds. They showed us live how they did this. Um, of course, they reported this to the vendor immediately, but that's some of the work that these teams are involved with. So they do a lot and they report and they contribute to to our community. Okay, it's stuck. It's not moving. Here we go. All right, I'm gonna build this one out real fast. So this is a little bit about architecture. So it's not only agentless, like I said, but it's passive. So it's not active in the network. And this, and I'm telling you this over and over because that's a question that you're probably gonna get over and over. Because that for that industry, that is very important. Sometimes noise can cause a lot of uh, disruptions. Um, within the switch that connects to your OT environment, um, you can span the traffic to a physical Defender for IoT sensor, and that could be a, a rack or a virtual device. Um, actually, my demo, because nobody would let me uh, put a, uh, <laughs> an, a sensor in their manufacturing facility, um, simulating that with a virtual device. So if you wanted to do the same thing that I have done, I'll, I'll show you how you can go about doing that. And I'll show you like some of the, um, what some of the screens look like too, so because so that you don't make this, some of the same mistakes that um, I made. Um, and all the analysis is done on the sensor itself. So it can, it can technically remain within your environment on-prem if it needed to be air gap, but you can also connect it to Defender for IoT through the Azure IoT Hub. And from there, that's when it goes to Sentinel. Um, on, the, on the deep packet in inspection shown here, uh, the IP and the MAC address are usually not enough. So we use um, deep packet inspection to get additional information on, on the devices in the networks. And it works with um, di dissectors as a plugin. So basically for each protocol, we create a plugin. And by the way, you can also create your own plugins. Um, so, so in cases where there's new protocols or where there's proprietary protocols, and, and we see that a lot with military cases, um, they won't share the PCAPs with us. So you can use Defender for IoT uh, Horizon SDK to develop your own plugins. And then on top of that, um, we have DPI services for firmware detection, for programming detection, asset discovery, um, behavioral analysis, um, code analysis, and, and even custom alerts. Um, all of that is uh, streamed into the sensor, which can then be consumed on-prem, uh, on the cloud, either way. Uh, and you can mine data for any dissector, for any protocol that you need uh, data on. So um, I, I don't know how much this is going to come up, but it's good that you at least uh, should be aware that it is possible to do. Um, actually, a little more, I wanted to show this slide because I wanted to show a little bit more on the architecture because in addition to the passive network sensors, um, that the one that I'm going to uh, demo today, Defender for IoT uses additional data sources like um, Defender for Endpoint. So in case, the IoT's um, uh, devices are collecting data to increase uh, the coverage. So I'll, I'll show you where you would go to configure this on, on security.microsoft.com portal during the demo, because there's actually two different types of sensors. Um, and actually, especially, and I'll, I'll tell you this, especially if you're wanting to do the same thing that I'm doing to simulate um, or to do a POC for a customer, 
Um, I, I can give you, I can share some instructions on what Nick and I followed um, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it is technically easy to just purchase a device and plug it into your network, but it's a little bit more of a challenge when you're doing what we're doing here, which is a hyper VVM inside a national VM. Um, that's what we, that's what I have configured here. Um, I'm actually going to build this fast. So a little on the, what they're calling EIoT or Enterprise IoT. I believe this is actually still on preview, and I'll show you during the demo how you can configure this. The idea is to get the same types of vulnerability management, threat detection response for enterprise IoT devices. So things that were previously only available for managed endpoints or OT devices. This is also agentless monitoring, and it helps secure IoT devices that are connected to IT networks like thinking uh, voice over IP, printers, smart TVs, whatever you got on your enterprise. Um, and this is included in Microsoft 365 P2. So you can also install the enterprise IoT network sensor, which is the piece that is currently in uh, public preview, to get more visibility into additional IoT segments of, of your corporate network that were not previously covered by Defender for Endpoint. Um, but, however, with Defender for Endpoint, uh, you don't need, uh, you do have the ability to install that sensor, but you don't necessarily need it so to get going with enterprise um, IoT. And again, like um, I'll show you in the demo where you can get this. Um, oh, so this is a little bit of information about how the flow for investigation from Sentinel to Defender for IoT. On the top, you see, and, and I thought I was using this earlier, I'm not. Um, on the top, you see the Sentinel, and on the bottom, you see Defender for IoT. The goal is to make us, uh, at least 80% available through Sentinel so that your SOC team can have access to this uh, as much information as possible. Um, and then, you sh so within Sentinel, you should be able to understand like the business impact of the incident. But then if you want to do like a deeper dive onto a defender for IoT, then it's just one click away and you can go do that. Um, and you can still have the uh, dedicated playbooks and notebooks in, in, in Sentinel. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Go on. Oh, this is a little bit about the solution content that is available on Defender for IoT. I'm actually going to demo this. So I just wanted to show you it's actually, it comes, and this is, I know sometimes we get this question whether these solutions are free. They are free. They're free of cost. They're available for you to use uh, and install. Um, and you get one uh, workbook, you get four, 14 analytics rules, and this is the last count, it might have changed. And um, you get four playbooks for response. Um, and this is all available. So once you install Defender for IoT, you can even start taking advantage of these solutions immediately. Um, oh, this is a uh, a little bit. Hold on. Make sure, I didn't skip any. This is a little bit about what your IoT um, maturity model should look like, from like starting with a spreadsheet and ending up with an asset inventory or CMDB. This just gives you a little bit of an idea of where your customer might be at and where they really should be aiming to be at. And like Indranil was saying, we will provide this. I, I just wanted to show it because it might be a, a good idea to show a, a path or a um, uh, for any kind of customer that is looking to implement this. So Defender for IoT, you can technically just Defender for IoT, find it here on the on the um, Azure portal. And you can also, this is why we even ended up here, because we were talking about Defender for Cloud, Cloud Workload Protections, and there's a little IoT security here. So that so that those are the two ways to get to where I am here. Um, so before I show you the sensor. I actually want to show you where you can actually get the sensor um, uh, software, right? Because you're going to need to to have a the software so that you can install it. In the case that you're not actually purchasing a a uh, a uh, an appliance, right? 
So you can come here to getting started on premise management and then you get the uh, the various versions. My current version is 22.1.7. Um, this version actually had an issue with uh, Hyper-V specifically, so I wasn't able to get around that issue. So this is my current version. I have another one, but this is quite different actually. So go with 22 wherever possible. And then uh, the other area you can get it is when you're actually setting up the sensors and you'll see the sensors that I have set up. Uh, this one was locally managed. I'm no longer using that one. Um, and and you get and, and I'll get to the enterprise one in uh, towards the end of this. Uh, but this is my uh, V22 sensor. So when I am onboarding an OT sensor, I can come here and it'll give you the instructions on what you need to do. And this is where you would come and download as well. So there's two different locations where you can get that information. And I wanted to show you that because, um, and by the way, that's that's going to be the uh, image that you're going to be installing for your Hyper-V VM. Are you able to see my VM? I just want to make sure. Uh, are you showing my VM right now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. So. Um, so one giveaway right here is um, is that I'm going to log in with CyberX. <laughs> uh, oh, CyberX. So this was our CyberX acquisition. And actually, before I even jump into the, uh, I'm going to leave that open for a minute. But this is this is what I did to configure this. And I'm, I'm letting you know because you're probably going to end up being in the same situation that I am where no, no manufacturing facility would allow you to do it for testing purposes, but this is a good way to do it. And by the way, there is a trial. You get a month for a thousand devices, so you can install this, give it a shot for a whole month and not have to pay a penny for it. Um, settings. So I wanted to let you know how I configure this. So this is a very small one. This is a four by eight. Um, so that's why when I installed it, I used the, the smallest possible. And um, this is a VM. I'm actually accessing a VM and then I created a Hyper-V VM inside that VM because this is based on a, on a, on a, on an appliance. So you have to use a, uh, a, an image. So this is where I specified the uh, the image I downloaded it and then I specified the image and then I just started it and, and it allows me to install it and actually when you install it I'm actually going to pull some screenshots that I have here so you can actually see what I would would have seen and I have those screenshots in my slides so you would actually see something like this when you first well first you see the language and then you get to pick and as you see I picked a four by eight because that's what I had um, and for version 22, this is these are the options that you're going to see. And then you're going to see, and, and I'll tell you, this is where I went wrong originally, and actually Nick helped me out with this, so kudos to him. There was a, um, a monitoring interfaces that you have to choose, and that is based on the networking configuration that you have on your VM. Oh. Oh, maybe I should show that first. Back to the settings. So you have some network adapters here, and those are the network adapters that are being uh, that you're being asked uh, what the monitoring interfaces are. And then you get to select the management interface, um, and then you add towards the end when you're done. And there's actually going to ask you for a few other information, such as the IPs, and this are this is all based on whatever IP configuration you have on the VM, um, and this is. Um, actually well documented and we can provide links to the documentation but towards the end you're going to get something like this and i recommend that you take a picture of it because you're never going to see this ever again and if you notice you're actually going to end up with a few different users cyberx was the one that i used to log in to to my sensor through the browser but you may need the cyberx host and the support one to do changes on the appliance itself at the command line so this is what that would look like. So you can, oh, I always do this. Oh, let's see this. So you, this is what you would see if you were um, running, when I, I logged in with, with um, 
with, let me see if I'm still here. Yes, I am. So this is what I would see if I logged into the sensor, if I needed to do some commands, if you're troubleshooting, this is actually gonna come in handy. One little trick that I'll show you is that, um, I'm actually going to bring this up a little bit, but you can actually type, let's say net, you know that it's related to network, just tab and then actually keep tabbing and it'll actually give you the, the list of, uh, of commands that you can use. So it, I think it's a, Within its limits, it's somewhat, um, and there's uh, somewhat intelligent, I guess, or easier to use. Um, and there's also great documentation on this. And I'm letting you know, in case you have to do some troubleshooting, that this is available and you can. All right, so then I'm gonna jump into the actual sensor and what you get. Oh, the other thing is once you log in from here, once you connect to your sensor directly, you're gonna have to activate it. Um, and it's because it has to know like which tenant is basically going to connect to. And so you get that information from here. So when you, um, in step three, you can actually register the sensor here. You put whatever the name of your sensor is going to be, whether it's going to be cloud connected or not. And then it's actually going to, when you click on register, it's going to allow you to download a, uh, a file that you're going to use to do that registration. And so when you come to your sensor and you log in, once it's installed, you'll use that file to activate it. So this is how it knows, hey, I'm going to Angelica's test tenant and this is what I'm gonna do with it. Another thing that I'm gonna show you, I, um, I'm doing this with PCAPs, sample PCAPs. So it's not a, it is simulated data that you're gonna be looking at, it is simulated devices. Um, from PCAPs that I got for testing purposes. But before I could even do that, um, actually on the old version, this was enabled by default on the V10 version, but in uh, V22, it is not. So for you to be able to play these PCAPs, because what I come is I do, I uploaded a whole bunch of these files and then I play them all. And then that's how I'm able to, to generate some simulated um, devices and some simulated alerts that you're gonna be looking at. Um, but in here, you have to actually use the advanced configurations. And it, and then there's a section here on PCAPs. Where am I? PCAPs here. And you have to modify these parameters here to enable that PCAPs, because otherwise you don't get to see the option to simulate it. So just wanted to point that out. This is how you get to see some of the data, All right? And so the information, that first information that you're gonna see is likely going to be your device map. Um, and here you can see all of your assets and I have them, uh, I already arranged them in a specific format. This one, this one. So I'm actually, I'm gonna, this is switching to layout by, by connections. It's just to see it in a different format. Let's try to make this a little bit bigger too. So this is what you see normally when you first come in. But in this industry, um, they actually use this uh, layout by Purdue uh, more often. Something that I, I was not familiar with because this is not an area that is my expertise. Uh, but you get to see this uh, in a Purdue format. And actually if you, um, continue to zoom in, you actually start seeing the various uh, connections. See, you see the connection, you can even uh, select them to, to see them as well. I don't know why it's moving slow for me, probably because I'm presenting on Teams, uh, but you can see the various levels to enterprise supervisory. And I don't know what the bottom one is called. There we go, supervisory and then process control. And you see the integrations between all of them. This is where people are typically um, shocked that, oh my God, there is a path to the uh, internet from this device that they weren't even aware of previously. Um, and actually, and this is really the largest, one of the largest problems with OT networks is that no one know what's there. They don't know what's there. So how can you secure what you don't know that you have? Uh, so having this device map automatically generated is a huge help. So you don't need <laughs> binders and maybe pages of schematics. Um, and keep in mind that we're not actively sniffing. This is all done again by deep packet inspection of the traffic that we get. Um, and okay, I wanted to show you, I'm gonna zoom out of this. 
actually, you can also search in here. And actually, in here, I, you can see that I was searching previously by OT protocol. I mean, when I do that, I can, um, it'll highlight those, see, it'll highlight it in blue, the ones that are related to that protocol uh, or that are using that protocol, I should say. And you can see the ones that are in here. You can also search by IP. I'm actually going to search for an IP because I want to show you something that I think is really cool. Um, let's see this IP. Yeah, that's the one. I think it's this one. And you can right click in here to view properties. Actually, before I click that, you can also mark them as important. That's why some of them were showing a little star before. So you can actually keep an eye on your on your crown jewels. Um, but I thought this was really cool, the fact that you can actually in some of them see the actual backplane um, on what type of communications adapters are available for this specific device. Uh, this is uh, a, rock, a PLC for Rockwell uh, from Rockwell. So this is the type of information that you can see in here. By the way, you can also edit this properties all the way here. So if you have any information that is not showing, but you want to keep um, on, then you can actually uh, add that information here. You get to see some other information. Uh, you get to see the actual map view that I was looking at. If there's any alerts related to it, you, and then you also get to see the timeline as well of, of those alerts. And we'll dig in into some of these alerts in a, in a little bit, but I just wanted to show you what kind of information you can get just from the very beginning uh, from getting uh, to that device map. You can also see that device inventory in uh, this format. Um, so you can take a look at um, in, in table format. And by the way, you can export this information as well. So if you needed to provide this information to somebody that doesn't have access to it, um, you could generate a CSV file and, and then open that on a spreadsheet and provide it to somebody else. It's very useful for compliance. Sometimes um, uh, auditors, they need to see this type of information, so you could just generate that report from there and provide it to them. Um, and by the way, you start seeing uh, this data in a matter of minutes, uh, even, even for real life scenarios. Uh, after installing the device, in a matter of minutes, you start seeing uh, and it, it's going to continue to to add more information as it becomes available. As the, and the more info they they get, the more they populate into this. The sensor does. Um, and keep, there's another architecture, by the way, uh, where you can have various sensors sending information to like a main mag management console. And then that console can send the information to Azure. So that's another possible architecture that you have. OK, and then we jump into um, alerts in here and you get to see um, some of the alerts that you get, like unauthorized Internet activity detected. Um, and by the way, you can acknowledge it. You can clear it. You can also add um, comments to it. Let me make this bigger here so we can modify. Um, so you can update this alert directly from here to close it, uh, to, to take some actions for it. I'm actually going to click on take action here so you can see what else you can do. Some of the things that you can also do is learn. So let's say uh, it alerted on unauthorized internet connectivity detected, but you're saying, guess what? This is really okay. Um, this is This is allowed. So you can click on alert learn. And what that will do is it'll actually teach the machine learning that this is normal for my environment. So don't alert me on this again. I don't need to know about this. Um, you can also download that filter PCAP. Uh, so if you wanted to do more complex in investigations. Um, and like I said before, you can also take a look at the um, timeline. What I like about this is that it actually correlates some of this stuff automatically for you. You can see that um, um, some, I don't know which one's this one, but typically what it does, it'll have one of these alerts and then it'll show you what happened and then what happened before and then what happened after of it. Um, all right, let's keep moving. The one, this is a uh, risk assessment. Um, this is probably the very first thing that I would do when I get to the system and you could just click generate report and it's going to get a report like this one. And 
I'm going to open this report. I'm going to download it so you can actually see it. This is the report that I would show the customer. Like the very first thing, I plug in the device, I start getting some information on it, hand them this report. Because this is, it'll give them all the information. First of all, it'll give them a security score, which is something that they're already familiar with. It'll give them a number of the devices. It'll give them the vulnerable devices too. And it'll actually give information on uh, uh, additional information on vulnerabilities as well. This is uh, a great report to show to your customers. Um, and likely they're going to be very surprised of what they didn't know that they had in there. But also it gives them something to, to work on like a to-do list. What am I going, what are going to be my priorities when I start uh, remediating this, uh, this, and I'm making sure that this is as, as secure as possible. So it actually gives you all that information into one nice report that you can just hand over to the customer immediately. Um, the attack vectors. I like to, um, to show some of the tests that I have been running here. Um, you can, like I was saying earlier before, for the crown jewels, which are like the, the ones that you can set uh, with like little stars in your map, maybe that's where you're keeping your secret recipe for whatever you're manufacturing. Um, and to be able to run uh, a simulation that says, what are my attack vectors on this device where I keep all my secret recipe for everything? Uh, so you want to be able to simulate how an attacker can get into that asset. Um, if there's internet connection, maybe you didn't know that there was internet connection. What CVEs are um, are in there? Um, I'm actually going to actually I have a few of them, so I'm just going to show you the ones that I have here. So this some of them are not at quite as high. So maybe we'll go with this one. This is Ian's machine. I knew that it was um, vulnerable, so that's why I generated it on this one. So you can actually see that it has an internet connection. So if you didn't think that it was there, well, guess what? It is there. Um, and then you can see uh, additional information. You, see, you can actually show it at the device map too. So, by, and there's a maximum of three, which is the reason why I have this one disabled. But you can actually go back to the device map and you can um, select this and you can actually see this is test. Um, so when I generated this one, I can actually see the, uh, am I not seeing the, hold on one second. Oops. One second. Maybe I need to clear. I must have had something else selected. Uh, I'm not able to see this. Okay. Let me not unselect this real fast. Yeah, I am still learning. Can't you tell? <laughs> oh, I see. This is why I had this selected. I had the IP, that's why I wasn't able to see this. All right, so now I can actually see Ian's connection. So I actually, come on, there we go. So I can actually see the, the, the ones that are highlighted in blue are the ones that are the connections associated with Ian's uh, laptop or sorry, workstation, it's PC. Actually, I'm gonna, log, I'm gonna zoom in here so you can actually see the connections. I have it in a star right now because it's uh, one of my my um, highly um, useful and see I can actually see when I click on it, I can actually see the connections and I can follow those connections to the various different devices that I have that is currently allowing connections to. And I can actually see the information about the workstation, the network connection um, that it has, and it also shows me the known CVEs associated with it. And there's another place where I can see the CVEs and I'll, and I'll show you in a little bit, but I wanted to show you that you can actually also see those uh, attack vectors from the map. Um, so now we're going to jump into data mining, which are your reports. And um, so this is where I was looking at. You can actually see the CVEs and all the various CVEs. See how Ian's um, it has a lot of them, and the reason is because this is actually on Vista, Windows Vista. 
happy. It shows graphics component in Microsoft Windows Vista. That's actually a thing that you see quite a lot in some of these manufacturing workstations where there are in some really, really legacy OS versions, which have typically a ton of CVs associated with it. Um, and then you can actually, you can export this into PDF format, and you can also export this into CSV format. So if you wanted to, um, to provide this information to somebody else outside the company that maybe doesn't have access to the sensor, you don't want them to have the access to the sensor, and you only want them to have CVE information, you can provide that to them via this report. Um, so that's one of the reports that is available here. There's a few other reports available. You can also create your own reports. Um, I don't know if I, let's see if I have internet. Yeah, so internet activity, there's some uh, report that provides that information for the various different devices in here. And I can also export those reports as well. Um, trends and statistics. So this is a dashboard. This is what you see here is one that I added myself, but you can customize this uh, to whatever you need it to. If you wanted to look at information, you can create your own dashboards here. It gives you quite a bit of options to begin with. Um, and new devices, maybe if I wanted to add some security, new devices. Um, and if I wanted to, let's see, I actually need to give it a name. And maybe top traffic by port and save it. And I can see that information in here. So it, this is highly customizable. It could be um, whatever data you need to look at. And you can add more widgets and add more dashboards to this. Um, OK, the, oh, one thing I wanted to, to show you in within the um, the area of the sensor are the custom alerts. So you can create rules. Remember we we're talking about the protocol that sometimes is proprietary protocol and they don't want to share PCAPs with us, with Microsoft, for us to develop uh, plugins. You can, you can create, that's a service that you as a partner can provide to your customer to create uh, a plugin for their proprietary protocol. And with that, um, it, this, piece would come in handy where you can actually create your own custom alerts. Um, actually, there was one case where I was, uh, um, one of the teams was talking about, they actually worked on, when they were working on the COVID vaccine, they needed to keep the temperature on labs and they needed to monitor the temperatures on labs within a certain temperature. It was very important. And so they came to the Defender for IoT uh, team to develop to create some rules so that they could um, monitor that temperature and then alert in case it went you know beyond whatever it needed to to be to stay within. And this is where you would uh, be able to configure those types of alerts. And um, and this is where you choose the protocol if it's a protocol that you um, that you have to work on. And it really, because a lot of the alerts are going to be generated automatically for you. But in the case of those custom protocols or proprietary protocols that um, we don't have access to, this is the way that you would go about doing that. Okay, now I'm going to jump over to the portal, to the Azure portal. So like I said, this one, I configured it, I, I installed the sensor, and then I registered the sensor by using this. So that's the reason why you see, this is the one that we were looking at, IoT sensor uh, B22. I can actually click on it and maybe see some more information on it. Um, and, and that's how I configure this one. If there is, if you needed to add another one, you could go about doing it the same way. Um, the one thing that I wanted to show you is um, you can also see the same inventory that we saw from the sensor. You can also see it from here. It's a lot of the, this information is coming from the sensor to here, but they're adding, you can see some of this stuff is actually in preview. Um, they keep adding a lot of that functionality to Defender for IoT so that you can get it directly in here. Um, and as, again, as we get more information from the deep packet inspection, we add it here as well. And then that's the same case for alerts. So if you wanted to see the alerts that have been, you can see that I have, I cleared, I did some testing a few weeks ago. 
I cleared some of them and then I generated some other ones again. And so this is what you see here, the types of alerts that you're gonna uh, see. You can see them here. And then if you're integrating with Sentinel, then you can also see them in uh, Sentinel as well. And you also get some workbooks here too, like the sensor help. So if you wanted to monitor to make sure that your sensors are working correctly, you have the ability to do that from here. Um, and you also get, there's another one on alerts as well. Oh, where are my workbooks? And you get one on alerts as well. And I don't have any alerts in the last 24 hours, but let me expand it here. So now I get some alerts. And if I had more than, um, if I wanted to look only at a specific uh, alerts coming from a specific sensor, then I would be able to, to do that. And these, this is all out of the box stuff. So technically you could improve upon what is available in here as well. Um, and then the last workbook, was the, um, I may not see in this, um, oh, devices and vulnerabilities. So the same type of checks that I was, um, and I'm gonna select my sponsor, so, okay. And I can actually take a look at the vulnerabilities that are affecting the devices. This is another nice uh, view to keep um, available and to show to your customers so that they they don't need to log into the sensor to be able to see this information. Um, and then you can also see it by site too. This is very important because sometimes you don't know where some of these um, devices are created. Uh, so maybe you can put, um, uh, if you have like five different floors, maybe put one sensor per floor so that you know exactly at least which floor this device is, uh, is in and, uh, and and do that configuration that way. Okay, the, um, uh, the workbooks, sites and sensors. Okay, I wanted to also show you, oh, we talked about the sites and sensor. I'm actually, the only thing that I have left in here is to do the enterprise stuff, and I will show that to you in a minute. Uh, but I did want to show you the pricing, and the reason is I have, I have um, this one I'm actually paying for, 100, uh, I have 100, devices and it's $140 if I'm not mistaken per month for this one, but there's a trial. And um, as you can see, uh, this one, the trial that I'm using is, but it's also available for the OT as well. It's the EIOT, Enterprise IOT. It's 30 days, a thousand assets. So you do, you can configure this and you can give it a shot and get familiar with it. Sometimes for me, in my opinion, that's really the best way to get familiar with it. Before I jump, to Sentinel to show you some of the features that are available for Defender for IoT over there. I'm actually going to go to uh, to show you the configuration for with MDE. Because as you can see here, I connected, uh, sorry, as you can see here, I connected a sensor, which I'm actually not using. I'm not using this sensor because I um, um, didn't need to use it. But you can also, some of the features that you get in here, I'm going to show you. First of all, where you go about configuring it, you go to settings, device, discovery, and you go to enterprise IoT. And in here, this is where I did my trial for enterprise IoT. Um, but you don't need to have a, and, and this is where it says you can set up a sensor and it just takes you to Defender for IoT sensor, the area that I was in. But you don't need to have a um, a sensor necessarily. Um, you can have um, this uh, information once it's set up in here. You will start getting information for for any MDE devices that are going to that are going to discover any kind of um, unmanaged device or IoT device. Like um, like I was giving in the example in the slides, you could do voice over IP devices, printers, cameras. So it really gives you that increased um, visibility to help locate whatever you're not able to see. And um, actually, and the other last thing I wanted to show you here, I don't have any devices, but if you had discovered any devices um, with your MDE or with the uh, sensor, they would show up here. 
So you would start, you would be able to see the, the discovered devices here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into another tenant, which I believe has some information. So, uh, so that I can show you what it would look like. Um, and maybe it's not as important because all it is is security.microsoft.com. Uh, it's not. See that I can show you it's one that actually has some devices in it. So you can see that would look like. Here we go. Yeah, so this one actually has some devices in it. So this is the type of information that you would be able from my to to. So this one's actually a Raspberry Pi, and this is probably a, a TV, a Samsung TV, um, which is somehow connected to the network. So it was discovered as well. So this is the type of information that you get. You start seeing it here. Um, OK, so the last thing I wanted to show you, and I know that we're not talking about um, Sentinel until Friday, and uh, hopefully some of this stuff will if, if you're familiar with Sentinel, it will make sense today. If you're not familiar with Sentinel, um, I I still uh, it'll make more sense on Friday about some of these features that are included in here. So obviously in my Sentinel uh, configuration, I have um, Defender for IoT connected to it. So I can see the data that is coming in I immediately. When I install this connector, I have workbooks, I have queries, and I have analytics rules include, included in here. And the any of the um, the data is actually going to the security alert uh, table. So this these are this is the only um, analytic rule that comes with this uh, connector, which is create incidents based on Defender for IoT alerts, which we already have. So that's the reason why when I come here and I um, want to expand it. Oh, sorry. Expand it to last 14 days. And then I'm going to select Defender for IoT. And I can see them here, those uh, that were generated. But there is a new Content Hub solution. So you add for IoT as well, for Defender for IoT. I think it was, this is it. And you can see here, it actually has 15 analytics rules, four playbooks, and one workbook. So this one, um, I'm actually, it's already installed in here. So I can actually go to maybe I'm gonna, I'm not gonna update it, but I wanted to see the um, one. I wanted to see if it would show you the actual analytics rules that are included. Okay, so here it is. So you get denial of service. Um, excessive logging attempts. So all these rules come as part of this solution. So you don't have to go and reinvent the wheel if you're um, providing this type of monitoring for your for your customers. Uh, firmware updates, high bandwidth, uh, all this stuff is provided for them. And there's also some workbooks which are not shown here, but I can show them to you over here. Um, playbook automation, active playbooks. And which are the, oh, here they are. Auto alert, um, status sync, auto close incidents, mail by product production line, and new asset discovery, uh, asset, sorry, asset service now ticket as well. So that's another super useful thing. So you don't have to do a lot of the work. This, what I'm, what I want you to know is that if you are using uh, Defender for IoT, and you are using Sentinel, you get that package deal, which is free. It's available on the Content Hub for free, and you can get going immediately with your customer. Surely you can improve upon that. You know, probably you can create your own, uh, modify some of these workbooks and make them even better than what they come. Uh, but it does, the team has provided you a way to get going, a way to start um, supporting your customers. And um, I um, I have reached the end of.